This podcast is brought to you by Bernie's Tap and Grill. It's family owned and operated since 1954. Located across from Wrigley Field on Clark and Waveland. My dad hit a few home runs on the Waveland Avenue, and Bernie's was my dad's favorite place to go. It's got delicious food, four full service bars, an awesome beer garden, a sidewalk patio cafe, and a cool upstairs area. It's the place I've always met my friends at before and after games. Go on by and tell Linda Dillman, Jeff Santos sent you. Bernie's Tap and Grill, where you go when you go to Wrigley. Sit back and relax. It's time for Peanuts, Popcorn, and Cracker Jacks. Hey, how's it going? I'm your host, Jeff Santo, and I'm here with my wife, Christy. Hello, hello. Louis Lombardi is our special guest. Yeah. What a cool guy and gifted actor. I mean, he's got a fascinating story. Sure does. Oh, man. And he's got such heart and conviction, considering Mm. where he came from. Right. Can't wait for you to hear his story. It's powerful. And my Cracker Jack call is to Sherry Matarisi. I talk about the Matarisis all the time, the Polanos. And Sherry, I mean... She's like a sister to me, and I haven't talked to her in such a long time, so so cool connecting with her, and I'm telling you, she has a great perspective of the Italian culture. Oh, yeah. My dad coming to Chicago, him and my mom staying at their home. It's just great stuff. Yeah, Can't okay. wait for you to hear that, too. Love, Sherry. And we have, um, I love these comments when they come in, and they just make me so happy, because otherwise we're talking into air. We don't know it's being received on the other side. So a shout out to DP Decker 33 for leaving the nice comment on Spotify. We appreciate it. All right. Thank you for that. And we got another one uh, that was sent to us. To our email. To our email. Which you have over there. Which I have. I'm going to read that. Okay. This was, this was kind of different. Okay. Hello, Jeff. I hope this finds you well. I'm very much looking forward to listening to your podcast. I just discovered them and will be digging in during my upcoming travels. Anyway, I am sure I'm not the first to mention this, and maybe it's been covered on your podcast. But the plural of Cracker Jack is Cracker Jack, not Cracker Jacks. It's one of those small things that just drives me crazy, especially when people sing, Take Me Out to the Ball Game. And I wanted to mention it. Thank you, Ken Carlson. All right, Ken. Hey, hey, you know. um, (laughs) You know, this is funny. This is this this is this is a big controversial thing, I think, because big. Yes, I think that you know there are a few people that do get upset about that. Okay. And you know the correct way versus what everyone wants. I mean, there's this political license. I mean, people have the ability to say, no, we choose it as, and then the majority of people like Cracker Jacks. Yeah. Well, I, you know, just, first of all, no one has said anything. I just want to tell Ken, no, we, no one, <laughs> not, not one person has said that because Cracker Jacks is like, yes, Cracker Jack. It's yeah, that's the Cracker Jack. But when there's a lot of them, there's Cracker Jacks. You know, and it's like RBI versus <laughs> RBIs, right? I mean, it'd be like, okay, he's got nine RBI. Come on. We say ribbies, RBIs. We said that when we were kids. I mean, this kind of stuff gets a little, it's creative licensing as far as I'm looking at it. And, and we do look at Cracker Jacks as people on our show. Yeah. You know, I mean, anyway, that's one of those things that I, I again, I go back to like RBI, art ribbies, runs batted in. You know, I, I get it. Runs batted in is RBI. But if you want to get that way and it bothers you that much, but I can, I, I get it. I get it, Ken. This is, this is your pet peeve, but you still, you haven't even listened to my podcast and you sent me that. I mean, that's a bit much, Ken. You might have to look into that one, but <laughs> I still want you to listen to our show, man. I, I, I think you'll like it and you might find a lot of other mistakes that I'm making and please don't send those. But <laughs> hey, if you like the show, send me a nice comment. I get it. I get it. Everyone to each his own. Okay. I get it, but Mm -mm. Cracker Jacks, I've been saying that my whole life. I want some Cracker Jack. I mean, it's it's almost... When I sing to you... I want some Cracker Jack. I say Cracker Jacks, but see, I didn't really grow up with Cracker Jack. See, I I even say Cracker Jacks because I... I, Yeah, well, I I didn't say, hey, can I have a Cracker Jack? 
I just, I just like to have one little kernel. I mean, that's how. That's how kids that's talk. True, true. I mean, but I mean, anyway, I don't because I don't say give me some popcorn. You, you look at I the say guy. give me popcorn. But I mean, I grew up around popcorn. But peanuts, and, I'll have some peanut. Have peanuts? I don't have a peanut. That's kind of more like that, right? And so I also feel like, you know, yeah, the guy in the box, his name was Cracker Jack, probably, right? That's the that's the gig there. It's I Cracker guess. Jack. It's look at him, he's Cracker Jack. But right. Our whole thing is, you know, hey, all right, grammatically, I guess we screwed up, Ken. Okay, but I hope if you're listening, you enjoy this show because I got a really tough cookie from the Bronx, and I don't think he he cares about Cracker Jack or Cracker Jacks. (laughs) 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 And uh, enjoy the show. Hey, everybody. I was in Encino, California the other day at a meeting, and I get out of there, and I'm hungry as can be, man. And there's traffic, L.A. traffic. And I'm thinking, I got to get some side streets here like my dad did in Wrigley. And I wind up at Coldwater Canyon and Riverside Drive, and there's Gino's East Pizza. Boom, park the car, go inside, and I order a tavern pizza. Cheese and sausage, my favorite. Top three foods of all time. And there's the owner, Dan and Todd. And they're like, hey, man, you're on the TV. I'm like, yeah, right, guys. They love to razz me once in a while. And sure enough, I was. My dad's documentary from MLB was playing. But I had no time for that. I had to eat my pizza. I devoured that thing in a minute. I was so hungry. You got to go to Gino's East for the greatest pizza around. Gino's East, L.A. Put it in your Google's map right now. It's going to be our place to go, me and Christy, on Friday's happy hour. Go to Gino's East right near Coldwater Canyon and the 101. Put it in your Google's map now. We'll see you there. He's born and raised in the Bronx with a tale of his own. My special guest has been in over 40 motion pictures and 50 television shows and series. He has a face and voice you'll recognize from movies and TV shows like 24, The Sopranos, Suicide Kings, The Usual Suspects, the list goes on and on. He wrote, directed, and starred in his own indie film. He's currently starring in Gravesend on Amazon Prime. And if that's not enough, he's also in the pizza business with his daughter, Louis Lombardi. It's so cool to have you on my show, man. Thanks, Jeff. Good seeing you, man. And you know, tell you know, we, we took, you got to tell the people how we met. Like, I think it was 2011, 12 at the Phoenix. No, Club. you go 2008. But we got to go back even further than that, man. You didn't know I, you didn't know I met you, and you were doing a reading at a theater in Los on La Cienega in Los Angeles for the movie Suicide Kings. Oh my God, that was like '97. Yeah, yeah. And I remember I got invited to it because was that through Dan Loria's. Uh, playwright group or something. I, I think it was uh, Wayne Rice. Wayne Rice is a big producer. He did Dude Where's My Car. He did that film, and I, I he might have been friends with Dan Lorio. But I remember yeah. Dan was a nice guy too. Dan was a great guy. I actually did the film The Spirit with Dan, but I go back with Dan since the early nineties. Right, to right. Who might star? Exactly. I did. I was in a. I had a play reading with Dan. Uh, Joe Montaigne and Dennis Franz did it. A rough great time. guy. What am I think? So I, I was in that group, and that's how I got invited. Anyway, I remember going there, and there were some familiar faces that, that were playing some of the parts that were reading for it, but I never saw you before, right? And then when you got, you opened your mouth, and your character came alive, I'm like, holy cow, man. You stood out with that voice and your presence. You got, I knew right away, I'm like, man, this guy's street. But he's got an honest core to his voice, man. And I remember I went up to you after the read, and I, and I introduced myself, and I just I had to just tell you I was it was captivating, man. Uh, I'm going to see you on some shows and movies. Wow, and yeah, that goes back into '96. Yeah, yeah, '96, man. I got out here in '93. Yeah, I was out here. In, yeah, I got out here in '94. So Randy, then I'm like, God, man. I mean, that's all I remembered from that reading. I'm like. This guy better be starring in this movie. And then you actually got the part in the movie. No, no. What happened with that was I was supposed to star in that with Frank, the guy that we were just talking about from Among Friends. Right. And Wayne, Wayne Rice wrote these roles for me and Frank, right? Like, remember Vic and Eddie from Among Friends? Remember Among Friends? Oh, of course. Well, well, Wayne Rice, how we met Wayne Rice was he had a bungalow connected to Rob Weiss's on the Universal lot. When Rob first got out here, he had a deal, Rob, at Universal, so he had a right. bungalow. And connecting to the bungalow with Wayne Rice. And he was a big producer at the time. And that's how we met Wayne. And Wayne was doing all these movies. Then he wrote, he loved me and Frank. So he wrote that role for me and Frank, right? So at the reading, we did the role. 
And when I went to audition, when they hired the director, the director didn't want me. He's like, he was like a, you know, ah, one of these Hollywood guys. No, I don't want, no, 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 I don't want, I'm going to hire Brad Garrett. And I used him with Frank, right? So I was like, Wayne was like, no, I wrote to him for him. No, I don't want Louie in the movie, right? I want, I want Brad Garrett and I want Frank. Okay. Long story short, there was one role, one day in a car with Dennis Leary, right? My buddy's like, Louie, I'm sorry. I wanted you in. The director's being an asshole, you know. I, 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 would you do the one day on the movie for me? You're in the car with Dennis Leary. He has a five page monologue and you're just going, yeah, boss. And Dennis is reeling off this five page monologue. Right. I'm like, Wayne's like, please, Louis, I just want you in the movie. I said, absolutely. He's my friend. I'll do it. One day, $500. Right. right. Okay. We get to the set. Dennis Leary turned the biggest, the biggest, uh, karma, instant karma ever. The director gets to the set. Dennis Leary's there. I'm in the makeup trailer. Dennis Leary's talking to me a little bit. Never met him. Never met him. Nice guy, right? Turns to the director. Director comes in. He goes, all right, we're going to do this. The guy, Dennis Leary, swear goes, no, we're not doing any of that. He goes, see these five pages? I'm throwing them out. He threw them in the garbage. He goes, <laughs> man, this guy are going to improvise the movie. And the guy's like, but you can't do that. He told the director, just go outside, sit in the trailer, and don't interfere with us. Exactly wow. what he said. And I was like, Get my, you know, I'm like, yeah, fuck you. Get your fucking jail, right? So <laughs> anyway, so we get in that car. We drive around for 12 hours, me and Leary, improvising, just running shit. Turns out I end up getting nine scenes in the movie, and Frank and Brad Garrett's role gets cut into a quarter of what it was. Wow. Because they, they weren't that good. They couldn't remember. Frank couldn't remember his lines. The movie wasn't that good. Uh, like the scenes they were doing together weren't that good. So I end up doing it on my own, stealing the movie because after that, those eight scenes, they put me in eight scenes. I was in the whole movie from just one day for five hundred dollars, right? And wow. then the director would so about so we were done filming. He was just, he was like a Hollywood jerk off. You know, he comes in, he goes, he goes, Let me tell you something, bro. All that stuff you did at the end of the night, he goes, none of it's staying in there. I was like, dude, what is your problem? You know, he's like the, the, the director with the big star book, the cowboy hat, the hot assistant, pat around the ass. <laughs> real jerk off. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Literally. And I, and I kind of had that. I was like, all right. So at the end of the movie, he said, it's being all cut out. Don't get too happy. I was like, see you later. I got my 500 bucks, right? right? About three months later, I get a call. Wayne's like, Louie, I need you to come loop for the movie. I go, loop what? I thought I was cut out. Loop what? I go to the looping in the valley. And who's standing the first face I see? The director with the big Starbucks, the hat on, the 20-year-old assistant, Pat. And I, he go, I walk in. He goes, I go, what do you want? And you know me. I'm very boisterous. I go, what do you want? He goes, I'm going to make you a star. I go, what? What? Oh, he goes, God. let's go. I'm going to show you something. Now, he's trying to be nice to me, and I have none of it now. I don't care. You want to cut me out? You want to be little me? Now you're going to get Louie. Now you're going to get <laughs> little me back, right? So I show up. I walk into the looping room. There's 20 people. The producers, the you know, everybody like, Wee! and I'm like, I think people are nice besides him. He just <laughs> his muscle. He puts the movie on and starts showing all these scenes. And I go, holy shit. Wayne's like, Louie. I go, okay. And then the guy's like, I'm going to make, make you a star. And I go, stop. I go, first of all, nobody in this room had anything to do with this. This was all improvised. We all know that, right? They're like, uh, yeah. I go into the director. I go, you did nothing. You didn't want me in the movie, and now I'm in eight scenes in your movie? Wow, Next man. time, make better choices, you jerk off. And I looped, and I left. I end up stealing the scenes where they wrote, Wayne Rice got a deal after that to write a movie for, or I don't know what, I think I forgot, uh, forgot the company, but it went bankrupt. But he wrote a movie, they paid him to write a movie for me and Leary from those eight scenes. Oh. And he wrote the movie, so wait, but this is even better because, Christopher Walken's in the movie, right? This is why you take it. You do little roles if it's, if, if, you know, if it's a friend or if it's fun. You do little things because when I did that, George Ann Walken, his husband, is Christopher Walken, right? Yeah. So she saw the movie and she loved me. She was like, I want you to, I want, we're casting this show. It's called The Sopranos. It was before Sopranos was done. Anything. There was a script. She goes, can you come in and read? I was like, yeah, absolutely. I didn't know. It was just a pilot. You know, I was like, hey, you want to come read for this pilot? It's a gangster show in New York. 
I was like, okay, because she loved me from Suicide King. Again, five hundred dollars, right? <laughs> right. I go, I read for her. She goes, we love you. We're gonna we're gonna figure out a spot for you. About a month later, I got Fantasy Island with Malcolm McDowell shooting in Hawaii, right? So I was like, oh my gosh, that was my first TV starring role. Like I did Paul Haggis's show at first with uh, Jason Gedrick, uh, Ken uh, Home, what's the, the big director of Joe Panaglione. My right. stuff, like there was this whole great cast that we did that, and then after that, I did Suicide Kings, and then so then George Ann Walker tried to bring me to the I get Fantasy Island, I moved to Hawaii for Barry Sonnenfeld, so I moved to Hawaii, right? Shoot that Sopranos cast, that pilot, they shoot, and it becomes The Sopranos, the first season, right? Right. My show gets canceled. I'm living in Hawaii. I'm 30 years old. I'm living the life. I'm making 30 grand a week. I'm eight. <laughs> I'm like, this is Hollywood. I love it here. Right? <laughs> Turns out my show gets canceled. I get blamed for being a failure. You're not funny. I go, I never said I was funny. <laughs> you hired me. So you might go, anyway, I get fired. The show gets canceled. I go back to New York to see my mom. Because so, I was like, oh, my God, show. You know, you're kind of like miserable, right? My show gets canceled. And this is where I say, when the worst things happen in my life, the biggest things come from it. That's right. why when Big tragedies happen. And that's the title of my book, Breaking the Cycle from Tragedies to Triumphs. Because every single time, and I'm going to go back even before I was an actor, my life in the Bronx. Yeah, when man. The worst, when the worst things happened, it became the best thing for my life where I am today. So I go back to New York to see my mom. My show got canceled. I made a ton of money in Hawaii on that show. I'm like, okay, this is what it is. I go to visit my mom, George Ann, not a casting, the second season of Sopranos is just beginning casting. George Ann walking goes, Louis in town? Have him come right in. And then I knew Gandolfini from 94, 95. We used to hang out. Before Sopranos, we were friends. So I was like, holy shit. She's like, I want Louis to come in right now. She told my agent. I go in. I have to get off the plane. I'm there a day. I go meet George Ann and Gandolfini and David Chase. Within an hour, James gets, James goes, I'm going to read with you for the big pussy role. I go, okay. So we're flicking through. He reads the first scene. I have like four scenes. He goes, all right, you're done. I was like, oh, my God, I just got fired. I just got thrown out of this room. This is all I hate acting. Now I went from I love this. I hate everyone. <laughs> right? So I get downstairs, get to my car. You got the role. You're going to do an episode. That, that, but that comes from the wow, $500 job. That's amazing. Took as a friend that turned into now The Sopranos, right? What a story, and right. I was going to do one episode. I knew Big Pussy since I'm 13 years old. If you watch his videos, he talks about how my uncles and we used to shake him down. He talks about it on the Soprano podcast. I know him since I'm 13. When I was 13, I used to go to his bars. And me and my uncles, and we used to you know, do that to all the, you know what I'm saying? Anyway, so we used to go shake the bars. He was one of the guys. And he says it. I was friends with Ducky. And he used to come in with his uncles. And he was his bag man. He used to shake me down. He used to say that. And I was a kid. So, but that's how, and then I get on the show with Vinny Pastore 30 years later on the Soprano. Weird as that, right? That's a guy crazy. Years, and George Ann loved me from the Suicide Kings and put me on Soprano to do one episode. Since the mean Big Pussy had that camaraderie, we ended up doing the whole season, and that was the whole storyline they added for us. That's a, dude, your but, story. But again, the, yeah, it came from believing in yourself, trusting a friend like Wayne Rice, put me right. in it, five hundred dollars turned into Sopranos, launched my TV career into the stratosphere. And what else came from that five hundred dollars? The creator of 24 <clears throat> watched me on Sopranos and said, I want to put you on 24. I was supposed to, again, do one episode. I did 48. We won an Emmy. Right. And that was the but, Jeff, it came from the one day for $500 with no lines. And that's what I tell actors. You show up. If you take that role, you better show up like Tom fucking Brady every time. You better get out there. You better throw touchdowns. I don't care. If you don't want the 500, don't do the role. Don't disappoint the people. Yeah, and, and, be, and be yourself. And be yourself. Be yourself. Because, and, and to have someone like Dennis Leary, who's been in the business, go, I recognize the talent next to me. We can just go on a car ride and make something happen. So you right. need that to happen, too. So there's, there's some luck there, but it's almost kind of like divine divine yeah. luck, right? And that's what I said yesterday. It was like divine intervention on the other podcast. Yeah. I was doing with the, the food lady. Yeah, it was the absolute yeah. divine. And I and then my friend asked me, would you do it? I said, fuck yeah, I'll do it for you. 500 bucks, is, it's irrelevant about the money, but I'll do you a favor. I don't mind. You're a good guy. You wrote the big role, and he was disappointed. But that big, but the point is, the bigger role got shut down, right. and my role was this, turned into the whole other movie that they wrote. So Yeah, and you got a vacation to Hawaii, which is... <laughs> right, I lived there for a year. Yeah, I mean, come on, yeah. man. 
I mean, just see how quick you did kind of like, you, you got on a rocket ship there too for a second, right? Well, 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 no, I got on a rocket ship, Jeff, as soon as I left Sundance in 1993 with the Monk Friends, remember? Yeah, that was, let's talk it, about that a little bit. I mean, I want to even go back into into how you grew up. Let's go there first before we go to the Monk's Friends because, you know, I wrote with Rob Weiss, which is another small world where it comes right. full circle. Right. I, I see you again when I'm writing with Ro- Rob. And so let's go back to how you grew up in the Bronx, man. Did you know, because your story is fascinating. Did you know that you were going to be made for something special from where you came from because it was such a rough place? I I knew that, and I didn't know I was going to make for something special, but I always had a great personality. I always bonded with people. I I was able always to put people together. Now that became a bad thing for people and it became a great thing for other people. You know, I was a bonder. Like, I knew everyone. I had a great person. I was always able to maneuver through the street. But as a, you know, as a young kid, you know, growing up, my whole life is saturated with people coming in and out of jail and dying. That's right. it. That's why I'm so immune. That's why when people die, I go, okay, I tell my daughter, I'm going to die too one day. It's, it's part of life. You got to accept shit. You know, I grew up in a world where, you know, me and you could be together every day. Next day, we never see you again because either you're dead or you're doing 30, 40 years in prison. That's my life. So... As a young kid, you know, my father was was killed when I was three. And people go, oh, that's terrible. But I look at it now and I say, absolutely not. Because my grandfather was sentenced to 30 years in, or 60 years in prison. My father was killed at the same time. What I believe that did was it broke the cycle for me. Because if my father was alive, would I be an actor? Probably not. I'd be in jail or dead myself right now at right. 4, 50 years old. You know, I, I, everybody gets led into that life in that world. There's no escaping it unless you mentally break it and escape it. So people go, that's a terrible thing. So at five, six, seven years old, I just meandered the streets by myself. That's how I knew Big Pussy. When I was who's, raising, was like, who's raising you? No one. Come on. Yeah, my mother kind of had a breakdown afterwards and kind of, you know, was like, you know, you know, after our, our, our husband was killed, she had two kids and so she kind of went off. So I, my mother would put me with my, my grandmother's. I still with my grand my grandma well, my other grandmother was like ninety at the time but looked it but you know she watched me for a few years then my other grandmother watched me so I bounced around them but that was again one of the best things that ever happened at five six seven years old because what I did was when I would be in their houses I fixated on the odd couple all in the family I would watch TV Carol Burnett show and I would sit in front of the TV by myself I could remember it like it's now and I would sit in this basement apartment and I would watch TV all day all night I didn't go to school. I didn't go to school from a very young age. I just didn't know anything. I just didn't know what to do. No one guided me. No one. So I would always just be on the streets at five, six, eight years old. I would walk around the neighborhood and everyone would be like, ducky, ducky, ducky. So everyone started, the neighborhood started bonding me, taking me in, other families, you know? So as I started getting older, I just was always a loner. I would always, that's why I think I'm so perfect. I can stay in my house for months at a time with nothing, no TV, no nothing. I just sit here, you know? I, I could isolate comfortably. Does that make sense? How did yeah? So, but how'd you get how'd you get that great personality? Because you, you're so funny. outgoing. You know, you know what though? When, after all the tragedies happened, all the people were just great to me. My my father's friends, my my grandfather's friends. Everyone just kept taking me, in. and I always had this joyful bubble. Even as a kid, they always want me around. I don't know. It's just something I was born with. That was my special talent. That's my acting school. My personality. I tell people that all the time. So as the years went on, five, six, seven, I fixated on TV, which was another blessing because what? That made me want to be an actor. Right. I had headshots at 12 years old. I show you, you'll be like, holy shit. People go, Sopranos should be great. I'm like, I've been doing this since I'm 12. I'm right. 55. So what is that? 40, 42 years? A long time. Is, is 43 what it is, years, right. So Your entire life. Yes, my entire life. And, and, and I, but I was still doing it as a street guy. So once I started getting 11, 12 years old, that's when I became a street person. I started hustling at at, at that age. Like I, you, any podcast, so you know, I had nothing. I didn't know anything. Like I never, you know, that's why people talk now. I never, I never really knew. I didn't growing up. Like I didn't understand politics, religions, races. I just bond with everyone if I like you. You get it? There was no like. Totally get it, man. I grew up in the Bronx. We dealt with blacks, Puerto Ricans, Jamaicans. We were friend, We were buddies. Italians, everyone, like Jewish people. No one, I, no one, no one, I didn't know the difference until I moved to LA about the difference between blacks and Jewish. And I didn't know, I was like, why are these guys killing each other in, in Venice? Why are they shooting each other? Like, why did not they? Because what I did was, as a young age, 
I was, a, I was a bonder. And I lived in all these different neighborhoods before I was 10 or 11. Then my mother finally got it together, and we got an apartment at 11 years old in the Bronx, in my neighborhood. But at the time, I had moved to so many neighborhoods, I, I, I knew everyone. When we moved to this one building, you know, I abounded with these four other kids who had no fathers. So it was just four of us on the streets 24-7. Wow, man. And we were kind of, and each one was kind of high in their own ranking and their families of who they were. You get it? But I was like the top guy because my grandfather was like a boss in the 70s. Up until he passed away in 1998. You know, he was like a main, man, massive dude. You know, and, and, and I would visit the prisons, right, Jeff? I, would, I have pictures of me five years old in Lewisburg, Allenwood, Danford, all the biggest prisons in the country, right? And I would visit. But all the guys in the prison, all my grandfather's guys that were away in the 70s, and they all bound to me. They all came out of prison, became massive dudes, even till today. So they, but as a kid, they don't like come and stay with us. We haven't need anything. So that's how I knew all the street people from the prison visiting rooms. How did you walk that fine line, man? And how did you? Again, I, I did. I did what I did. But, but this is how it got happened. So as a kid, I would watch the guys in the visiting room and their families and watch how miserable they were, and how dis destroyed their lives were. And I'd be like, this is not what I want. I have a, and, and be, that, luckily I was put in that isolated position where I watched TV that gave me a dream and a hope. You understand? Oh, totally, man. And so, so at 11 years old, I moved to this one building, but I had accumulated 100 friends by then. All the neighborhoods. You know, everybody always wants to fight the other neighborhood. I want to fight. I want. So as a kid, I started going, why are we going to fight with that neighborhood? We could, we could, we could sell weed. We could make money. We could sell this. We could do this. And people started going. And, the, and I was the connector for 100 people. Wow. I'd be like, come here. Come to the, my neighbor. Come in. That's how I put this ring together of like 40 dudes. That ended up getting uh, 20 years in prison, everyone. And I'm going to tell you how I got away. And it was almost, again, another divine intervention. I was like the leader of all these guys in the Bronx. But I'd be like, all right, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to do it. You know, I knew everyone. And I was kind of a big, big, aggressive dude. Like I am now, like big. I was at a 12 years old. You know, I was always a big dude, and I was always I was way more aggressive. Now I'm like mellow, right? So I started connecting all these street dudes. And what happened was we started one thing led to another. Before you know it, as we became 15, 17, 18, it became bigger. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like the drug world. Everybody started throwing drugs, becoming bigger, becoming bigger. And that's when greed set in. And I used to tell people, you know, you know, greed is like cancer. Once you get it, it's done. And yeah. these are guys, and there's guys in my neighborhood that I helped out when they were nothing. And I'm, so as soon as the big money started coming in, this is how I got out. You know, and I remember I used to visit the prison since I'm five until 25 all the time. Lewisburg, you're up visiting me five. And I met, I used to, I, that's how I knew this whole street, everybody, right? So as we got to the streets and we finally settled in, my, uh, I, I started hustling, and as we got older, the guys that were once killed for me for free were making 50, 60 grand a week, right? Started getting greedy. Well, greedy. I go, what are you talking about? When you were getting your unemployment check, you were buying me sneakers. Now you're making 50 grand a week, and you're, you're worried. So one of my dudes one day is like, I'm, I'm working with him, and he goes, what are you making? I go, $1,000. He goes, you're making $1,000 off me? I go, you're making 50 grand. I could make him 10 off you. I thought I was doing you a favor. Oh, no, no, you're making $1,000. No, no. Cut. Long story short, the other crew of dudes I was friends with, they hated, right? I don't like those guys. They end up cutting me out secretly, going behind my back, and working with those dudes. And the best thing that ever happened, because for $1,000, they all got pictured indicted for dealing wow, with each other dude. in the streets. For me, you would have never seen it because I was living in the building. I would go get it, bring it out, and no one, there was no pictures. No, we're in the, we're in, it would have never happened. And you know how I found this out? When they all got pinched in 91, 92, I looked at the indictment. I still got it on my balcony. I looked at the indictment, I looked at the pictures, and I'm like, wow, for $1,000 that I was making, you would have never had this. You would have still been okay because you wouldn't know where it was coming from. But you cut me out to save $1,000 and you were making 50 and you all got pinched because it's on video pictures. You're in the street dealing with the dudes who you once hated. And if you would have known, these guys would have known you hated them. These guys were serious dudes. They would have killed you. They would have killed these guys. They, you know, these guys were serious guys, but they were my friends, right? So I was like, all right, that's intervention. Wow, buddy. So that's how I was able to get out. They cut me out for it. That's, that's the story we're doing with MGM. That's my show. Wow, man. And so for $1,000, again, with an intervention, 
So me having that tragedy growing up without me being forced into the life, my grandfather don't do 60 years and my father don't get killed. I'm in that life. Yep. And I'm that are in jail right now doing yep. prison, you know? So that was the first escape intervention. Second was when I was on the streets and I put all these dudes together, they cut me out for the thousand was the second intervention because ready for this? Jeff, Best thing we ever. Shot, we shot, yeah, we shot amongst friends in 1990. All my dudes got arrested in 91. Okay. Yeah. 93, Rob calls, I know, and we were friends. We'd all hang out in Long Island. Rob calls and goes, hey, man, our film got accepted to uh, Sundance. It's a film festival in Utah. I look around in my neighborhood. Everyone's in jail. It's a doomsday neighborhood. No one's around. You can't do anything anymore. I'm looking around. I go, I got nothing. This is like a sign to say, get the fuck out of the neighborhood for good. Yeah. And that was Two years after, remember, two years, we shot among friends, 90, 92, they, they start, you know, 93 is when the festival happened. So, you know, that was in the works. But when all my wor criminal world sh crashed down, right, that door opened because I got a phone call from Rob. And I'm sitting in my apartment going, what do I do? I have nothing. But I'm sitting there thinking the phone rings and it's Rob going, remember that movie we did two years ago? It's that Sundance. That's amazing, man. And just even thinking about the part of where... You did the movie in 90, and that independent films, it makes sense. Sometimes it takes three years to get out, right? Right, so, right. So, but you're making that movie, Rob puts you in it, knows you're living the gangster life. So a lot of those guys in that movie are really and, living the gangster life. And Jeff, I get a role, my first big role was a weed dealer. I was a weed dealer my whole growing up. That's what I did. He didn't know. That's why I guess I was so What did he know, though? What did he know when he got you? Not what did he know? street guy from the Bronx, right. he, didn't, he might have known what I was doing, but when I met him and I auditioned for the role, I didn't know it. Nira Savino cast us. She was no one. Wow. She was no one. She was an actor. Her dad yeah. also made up 15 grand. She was an associate producer. She was a casting director. And she got the role by accident because the, all the actresses backed out at the time and she knew the lines. Rob said, why don't you just do it? She did it. So when we drove to Sundance and the film was a hit, Robert Redford spotted her in the film and loved her and put her in quiz show and that launched her career almost right. by accident. So, but as a kid, Jeff, when I was on the streets, I was doing these NYU films. I didn't have money to go to school. I didn't want to go to acting school. So I learned how to act by at 10, 11, 12, 13, 15, 18, I would audition for NYU films and I would audition for them, but I would learn how to act for free on a set, right? But I also got a hundred thousand dollar year of education as a filmmaker. Because I would watch and learn on these NYU films. So I didn't have to pay to go to school or pay to go to acting school, but I got all this. You were taking it all in. And you knew you were yeah. taking it in for, for yeah. a purpose. I loved which it. Is, which is unbelievable. And it. yeah, you're sitting in front of the TV because that's your life. You're, you're, you're dreaming that, you know, you're going to be inside that television set. I mean, it's amazing, man. It's, that's, and, it's that's, all, and it's all a force. Like, you didn't know, but everything happened for a reason. Yeah. So when people cry, boo-hoo, uh, my, my somebody... Excuse me, somebody died, or I go, get it together and just keep moving forward. Great stuff happens. If you sit there in a dark corner for the rest of your life because you lost someone, you'll be in a dark corner for the rest of your life. I'm that person who can climb out of a horrible situation in a second. In a second. Yes, wow. You don't know me. I'm very strong mentally. Like, you wow. know, and I've always had that mentality of being alone and dominating groups of people, guys, like big, you know, street dudes. Like, I would always have that. You know, aggressive yeah. man. Everyone I get follow. It. Everyone I get it. follow. You know, I get it, like, man. we want to be with Ducky. We want to be with Ducky. That's what they used to call me because even big street dudes were like wanted to be around me. You know, I was always like a personality, a big strong guy. I would go in a bar. I never went to school. I quit at fifth grade. Wow, man. <laughs> but all my education came from self knowledge, learning yep. how to act free on a set instead of sitting in a classroom because I hated classrooms. Then learning how to make movies on $100,000. And that was, and I, I ended up, you know what happened was I would show up. And I would give everybody weed and I would go drinking in the bars. And, and these were kids at 15, 17 at NYU, 18, you know, going to college, yeah. right? They, so I would take them all out and I would have so much fun with them. Like, you know how you know how to film schools are. You, you do a movie, everyone works on it. They do. So they kept going, want to be in my movie? You want to be in my movie? So that's how I did yeah. so many movies. Wow, man. So that's how I learned and how to act from nothing. With no money, nothing. I, I self-educated, uh, NYU education. Uh, a massive uh, acting school education, all for free. You know, that that's because also the toughness that you, you grew up on the streets with. And my dad had a lot of that. City guy, dad left him, you know, tough kid. And like you said, you can turn it on and off. He could do it too. Like he could like 
switch that focus to where he needed to go and and be done with it, man. I've yeah. seen him, you know, and that wears off on us too, even though we didn't have the hardness he had. But I understand what you're talking about because my dad yeah. lived a similar. I mean, I and I could see that in you, man. Since I've known you, I could I could feel that. And I and and the, the thing that I feel the most from you, though, Louis, is just how gracious you are, you know, and honest you are when when I speak with you. Um, and you're fun, man. When whoever said you weren't funny on uh, in, in Hawaii with uh, Fantasy Islands bullshit, because you're fun when you're serious. That's yeah, the kind of that's... funny you are. When you get serious, you get funny too. Right. It's all wrapped <laughs> together, man. But again, that was the best thing that happened. And tell me I wasn't funny because what it do? It led to me the biggest show yeah. in TV history. It's the problem. It pushed me forward to that. Now, right? totally. But, totally but, now, but, now but, getting. But, but Jeff, it pushed me forward with four hundred thousand dollars in my pocket at thirty years old. That's that's a right? God, it's like God going, here's this, shut the fuck up, take what we give you, and go to the next step. And yeah. I go to visit my mom and it became the biggest show. So, you know, that's the way I look at it. Even yeah. though that was a horrible moment, you know, going, well, you know, and I thank God I wasn't funny, because I wouldn't be on surprise. Right, right, right. Right. right? right? And, yeah, and and more importantly though, man, just to know that like what you kind of wanted to do, you, you were you were moving towards entertainment from the the day you were probably speaking, because you well, got an well, you entertaining what... voice and and just that p- personality just comes out so quickly. It's like machine gun fire, right? And I and I feel that, you know, when you did come out to Hollywood and things were starting to go well, did you accept it? Did you think that oh my my pass is going to come into this world too? Oh, no, not you at all. Worry about but, that? You know, what's funny is when I when I would do these NYU films and I would bring the tapes into the social clubs and we'd all be hanging around playing cards and you know we that's all I did every night. We just Back, took back, yeah, you know, play cards with my cooked in the social club. I'm talking from 13, 12, you know, like that. Right. So I would bring in these NYU tapes and put them in the VHS player. And my friends would be like, what the fuck is that? And I'd be like, I'm an actor. They'd be like, you got Hollywood, some fucking jerk off. What are you? I go, what? They'd be like, no, 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 what you saying? Who the fuck, what are you doing? What is this? And I'd be like, and I was so proud. I was like, they're my student films. They're like, what the fuck is that? Oh, what the fuck? No want to be an actor. Oh, Hollywood guy, you know, that old right. Megan. Right to take people who do that are afraid to take a shot so they'll try to knock you so you don't do it yeah. but they're insecure jealous haters and they don't they have no heart to do that or they have no whatever so they want they don't want you to do it yeah and if you follow friends i tell my daughter all the time follow no one follow what your heart believes if you love something i don't care how many people so hate true you. man my mother told me to become a construction worker i said you go wait a fucking construction worker i'm being an actor <laughs> and now I'm so proud of you. And let me tell you something, Jeff. I as when I got to Hollywood, right? All my dudes got 40 years. My grandfather was doing 60, so they're all in the prison together, right? And I, <laughs> I told myself, oh, watch out for some of these guys because they're not tough guys. He took care of all of them, right? And I would get calls from the prison. They would pass me around. I mean, that's my whole life is being passed oh, around the prison five. Hey, talk to this guy. So when I when I was older, when my friends were in jail, when I was in Hollywood doing movies, they're like, "We love it. You're watching. You. We see you in all these movies. Oh, you're man. the cop. You're the cop." And I go, "Hey, motherfucker! Remember when you used to laugh at me in the fucking club? Remember that? <laughs> oh no, you know Doc. You know Doc." I go, "Okay, how's prison? I'm in Hawaii making thirty. Like, you're in a prison cell. How's the food? I'm oh. like, from the fucking boat." And I would torture them, and they'd be like, "Okay, <laughs> we deserve it." And these are the same people that made my life by ruining my life, by cutting me out, thinking it was terrible, turned out to be the biggest thing ever. And it made me move on to the second part of my life was Hollywood. And when I moved to Hollywood, I was aggressive. Ask Matt Levy. I knew him back then. I knew Frank for a while. I was aggressive. Yeah. I didn't control myself because, you know, I looked. But again, I looked at the toughness of the streets, right, that bred me for Hollywood. Yeah. Because Hollywood is a tough place. you got to be mentally tough. And I'm the one who that of amongst friends, besides like Rob and like Mira, no one else is there. At right. a 20, I'm the and I'm still thriving. Like I'm still I'm at projects and movies, I'm starring in. That's 30 years later. It's amazing, and again, man. all mental toughness. And that's what my upbringing in the Bronx, you couldn't break me, you still can't break me. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you do. I'm, I'm like a fucking, you know, and that all came from my upbringing of, of hardcore life. Yep. But it ended up setting me up for the second part of my career, which was harder than the streets, but I thrived in it because you couldn't break me. So I couldn't get rejected or dejected or I didn't care. I'd walk into rooms and people would be like, well, these people are like, I don't give a fuck. I sat in rooms with guys that have killed 50 people, rooms all my life. 
I have no fear. I go, what are you going to do? I'm not going to go to jail. I'm not going to get killed. I, that was my mindset in audition. Yeah, yeah, that's great. You know, yeah. What are you going to do? Who the fuck are these people? So I would walk in and just but be me, my personality, even before I acted one word. And they'd be like, we love this guy. And that's how I got I mean, my My confidence was always by acting school and my personality. Yeah. So when I go in these rooms with these mega producers, that's how I got so many movies early on. Before any TV shows, I did like 50, 40 movies. I would just do movie after movie after movie because I had no fear. I didn't care about Hollywood people. I didn't give a fuck. What are you going to do? Not hire me? Okay. Yeah. You know? you're, you're, you're layered. Yeah, man, you're layered psychologically. And it's it's amazing because you actually dive deep to to get yourself psyched up to say, what do I got to be scared about? Look yeah. at my life. I'm here. I'm, right. I'm here, man. I'm standing here. I'm going for it. And, you know. That attitude's amazing, man, and, and, and I see it in you every time I talk to you, man, just feeling it now. That moment was brought to you by The Audio Suite, a sound recording, design, editorial, and mixing company for film, broadcast, advertising, music, podcast, audiobooks, and multimedia industries. The Audio Suite provides high-quality services at cost-effective solutions to meet your post-production needs. Voiceover, narration, ADR, sound design, sound effects, editorial and sweetening, recording, mixing, mastering, audio restoration, and more. The Audio Suite will get you to the finish line on time and on budget. Steve Harrison, owner and designer mixer, has decades of experience and has worked with various clients from HBO Films to Penguin Random House to us, Santo Films. When we needed post-production mastering for our independent film, Dead in Five Heartbeats, the audio suite was our go-to place. Steve is knowledgeable, reliable, and always delivers the highest quality. Go to www.audiosuitestudios.com. We highly recommend. Cracker Jack. Hello. Call is being recorded. Sherry Matarisi, you are my Cracker yes. Jack. <laughs> Well, hey, how you doing? I'm Good. How are you? Jack. You are my good. cracker, Jack. Oh. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Oh, you... good. I've been listening to the show. My God, it's great. You're doing a great job. Oh, a great you. job. I'm really enjoying it. Thank you, Sherry. And, you know, I wanted to call you for a while. I talked to Linda first, your sister. And talking to you, you have a large memory. You're a lot like me. You you watched a lot of stuff growing up. Uh, you took it all in. You were one of the biggest I Cub did. fans ever. So uh, I I can't wait for this conversation. I'm glad it's here. I want to start. Well, I'm with... honored. Thank you. And I am a huge Cub fan, and especially back then. But <laughs> yes, always. Yes, you were. Yeah, I, yes. I was re- you, ridiculously you, so. It's, I had the posters yes. on my walls and <laughs> autographs everywhere, and yeah. You you did, and did that start with my father? Uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, it did. Um, I think I was five when your dad first came, when we first met him. I, I always yeah, thought but, it was his first year, but Diane always said it was his uh, sophomore year of baseball. Baseball. Really? Uh, but yeah, I, I don't. No, 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 no. I think uh, uh, it was pretty quick. I thought that right. uh, it's what I thought. Who's because I know for a fact that you were five. Um, yes. Tony Calamino. Talk about that guy. He was the guy that 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 had my dad meet your dad and mom because he knew my dad's uncle, Sam, or something like that. Right. OK. And yeah, I wasn't real sure about the um, I knew it was your dad's uncle. I don't remember his name, but uh, yeah, Tony was my sister Linda's godfather. And okay. he had I, the way because my sister Linda told the story, and I thought I thought that he wanted your dad asked for a good Italian meal. Like, where could we go where I could get a good Italian meal? And he meant a restaurant. And Tony said, I, "I'll take you for the best Italian food. She's not Italian, but she cooks as good as any Italian I know." And then brought your dad over to our house for dinner. Wow. And um, that was that was the first time that we met him. And then you know they. It was just a natural thing. You know, my dad and your dad hit it off really well. And then my mom felt so, you know, he he was younger. And when she heard that, you know, your mom was in Washington and she was pregnant, you know, it was felt, you know, bring her, we'll help you and kind of, you know, you can stay with us until you get settled, that type of thing, you know. 
Wow. What, what, wow. That That's awesome. And, and your dad, obviously, you say that your, your mom's Jewish. Your, obviously, your dad, Matt Reese, you're very Italian. Big Joe is my, well, my godfather. Mom is half, yes. And Go my, I'm sorry to interrupt. My mom was also uh, Norwegian. So that that was another thing they had in common because your grandma Vivian was Swedish. Yeah. And then my yeah. mom's mom was Norwegian. My mom's dad was Jewish. So wow. the, my Norwegian grandma actually lived with us. And um and yeah, yeah, so go ahead. Wow. So 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 my dad, he comes there and then and then they stayed with you guys for a while, right? Do you remember that? Yeah, I do. I do. I remember like I remember when Ronnie was an infant, so we're five years apart. So I remember him like as young as like being in his crib. And then I remember real vividly him being in a walker. So I do remember. And I remember that um, my mom and your mom would be there during the day. And I was in kindergarten. I had to go to school half a day and I didn't want to go. So I would in the morning, I guess your mom always tells the story, but because I said every morning, and she's like, every morning, I would fall down the stairs, like fake fall down the stairs, <laughs> because, because I didn't want to go to school. I wanted to be with your mom and my mom, you know? Wow. So, yeah, and I do remember. I remember a lot. And I also remember, like, there were times, you know, your mom and my mom, they would take Ronnie and I and put us in the car while we were asleep. They'd say, okay, go back to sleep. I, I wish I knew now what they were doing. <laughs> But I did, I did used to listen. Like sometimes I would listen, they would say, go to sleep and you didn't, you know, and then sometimes I would listen to them, you know, but, um, and that, and maybe it's because like the one year they took us to the all-star game. Oh, wow. It was in Ohio. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, th- I mean, I don't know. I think it must've been like the late sixties. Does that make sense? Time could have been the mid sixties. Yeah. Or yeah. mid sixties. Yeah. yeah. It was yeah. the mid sixties. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and we went to an all-star game, and it was kind of that thing, like a last minute, your mom and my mom, you know, plotting, let's just go, you know, and then they took us in the car, it was like in the middle of the night, Ronnie and I went back to sleep, and then, I mean, he was so young, I remember him playing like with his little matchbox cars. Wow. In the dirt wow. while the game was going, and neither of us realized that, you know, how enormous yeah. it was that we were in an all-star game with like <laughs> Lily Mays and all these people. You know? Right, right. And you became, <laughs> and, and then my mom and dad got a house in Elmwood Park that yeah, uh, your did. mom and dad helped them get. And yeah, what was it like my dad being Italian in that, in that neighborhood? Tell oh me about my that. gosh. Oh, it was wonderful. Everybody, because it was like 98% Italian back then. A ninety five right. whatever. Everybody had a vowel at the end of their name, let's just put it that way. Right. And um and they just oh my gosh, everybody just loved your father. I mean, they were so proud of him, you know, like all the Italians. A lot of them were first second generation from Italy, you know. And yeah. they were just so proud to have your dad and, and he was such a good role model, a great role model, really. He would, uh, I remember he used to go to St. Vincent's every morning before the game, he would go to church. Really? And then, yes, wow. every morning faithfully. And then he would also be so gracious and good to like all the kids. They'd ride their bikes up, you know, and be peeking to see, is he there? You know, and he would sign autographs when people asked him and talk to people. You know, he was always so down yeah. to earth and would take his time to talk, whether it was a little kid or whether it was a 90 year old man, you know, he would. He would always take the time to stop and talk. And yeah. another, I thought of this the other day, Jeff. I don't know what it was that made me think of it, but they had this dog named. It was its name was Matt after my dad, because my dad's nickname was Joe Matt. And Matt? Um, they had a Matt M O T T S. Yeah. Okay. And so the dog was a German Shepherd. His name was Matt. So he, and it was just a funny thing, like watching your dad, because the dog he tried to train the dog, and the dog wouldn't do what he would say and stuff, you know. But, um, he, yeah, they had this, it was a small house. It was just like a two bedroom house. It was about right. a block and a half away from us. And yeah, everyone in Elmwood Park was just enamored. We had Ron Sano living in the neighborhood, you know? Oh, and, um, you, yeah. And I wasn't the I, type to go tell people like, I know Ron Sano, you know, but eventually people learned, you know? And, yeah. I, I, cause I, I was never there. Obviously Ronnie was, a little baby at that time. I, I think right. they were there for what, a couple of years before we went to Park Ridge when I was born or that right. I was born right at the time. And then they moved to Park Ridge 
But uh, I just picture like Joe DiMaggio in New York, and I, I feel like my dad was like that guy here in Chicago, right? Even the mobsters, yeah. oh, kinda, absolutely. You know, came to the ball games and and followed him. <laughs> tell us, tell us thing oh, about yeah. how how the Cubs uh, brought him in one time. There oh a- yeah, oh yeah. It was a relative's anniversary party, a very close relative, and um, your dad came, you know, and. It was wonderful. We had a wonderful time. At one point, my mom came in and she said, you know, oh, God, I don't know if I could say this. She said, she says, you know, the G, I think the G is here. And that meant the FBI. <laughs> right. And, you know, I remember her telling me, I have a very vivid memory of this. And she said, you know, I think the G is here. They're taking down license plates. I believe her main concern was your father, you know. Right. And, um, and you know, he. I think he, he had RS-10 or at that time, R, he, remember he had RS-10. Yeah, I think that was a little a later. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it might have been the RS-300. And anyway, so when he went to Wrigley that Monday or whatever it was, he was called into the front office and they said, you know, we got word that you were at this party and you can't be around these people, you know. And your dad, you know, said, "Those are that's my family. He's my one of my close, dearest friends. And uh, I didn't do anything wrong, you know, and kind of stood up to him and said, you know, if, if, if I'm invited to another gathering that they're at, I'm going to go type of thing, you know. Right. Out of respect. It was because your dad, yeah. I mean, obviously you guys lived in the thick of it, but you weren't in the thick of it, right? So it's, it, but it's the neighborhood. So everyone knows everyone. And Well, yeah, the, the, the neighborhood is, exactly. And the neighborhood at that time that I lived in did have really big name people, you know. <laughs> yeah. That are yeah. books now and stuff, and it's <laughs> kind of like the same thing as baseball. You know, I didn't realize what I was, at, you know, who these people were until I got older. With baseball, I did, but you know, you didn't realize right. the gravity, like, of the some of the people that you were around and how fortunate we were. You know, to yeah, have that. And I always felt, I always felt when I came over to your house, it was just a lot of fun. People from the neighborhood come over, and it was, I don't know, it just it just felt like warm and 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 just a huge family and i just oh, and the calusis were great i mean just so many of the people that that we got to know but you're right like my dad's gonna go to a a, a wedding or an anniversary because that's where he was taken in i mean i could see him saying what what the hell you know i'm not right, doing anything wrong right these are my friends They're, yeah you know, and, you know, and they, to be to be honest a lot of the mob guys they loved your dad you know they loved it and your dad was such a big personality you know he always had a story right. to tell and he really he always engaged everyone and before you knew it you know he had the attention of the whole room without really trying you know right. because right. he was such a good storyteller and just you know very captivating and um they they loved again they were very proud that this italian person had made it to the major leagues and you know he was a great rep- representation for the italian american communities you know yeah man that's so cool yeah um, yeah Sherry, what 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 did big joe do at lincoln park i know that he had a job there he did what was that oh um he actually he owned the train and merry ground the concession they used to say the concessions it wasn't a concession stand though it was a um a beautiful merry ground he had and a train and then for a short time he had horses but they, he said they were just too hard to keep you know like they went around in a circle for the kids to ride on so he but, owned um, that he had train, a train that... That... yes yes and he actually did all the mechanical stuff in himself as far as i remember he was working on that thing all the time we had like a little ticket booth you know that it, the train would pull into the engine would pull in at night. He'd work on the engine and he used to, he did so many crazy things, Jeff. He used to say that it was, he had the longest tunnel in the world. And I would repeat it. And my mom's like, it's not the longest tunnel in the world. Your dad just is saying that, you know, and he's like, well, you can't, you can say anything you want. He, he would have, the kids would be on the train and he would have a guy come up on a horse. Like he was robbing the train and oh he put a God. bandana on and he had a gun. Yeah, it was just, Hysterical, but you know, look, you could never do that now, of course. No, but that, you imagine? that was the, you know, no, the, no, no, I, the train, <laughs> no, I, I rode on that train a lot. I got a picture on that train with your dad, right? So many times you love that train, yes, yeah, and he'd uh, let you sit on his lap and drive it, yeah. Oh my god, and that's yeah, it was, and it that was train, fantastic. It was so much fun. 
That train was right in the middle of Lincoln Park Zoo. Is that where it was? It, yeah, it was kind of, it, I mean, it was against, there was like a fence next to, so I, I don't want to say it was like the end, but it was on one of the, it was on the perimeter, but it was inside the zoo. And I remember it was close to the lion house because I always liked the lions and tigers, like all the big cats the best. And so I, I loved that we were so close to the lion house because once I got a little bit older, they would let me, you know, cause we'd be there all day. I could go, right. I was close to the lion house. And it was it was a wonderful part of growing up too. I got to go into the nursery when there were like baby chimpanzees. We could yeah. feed them. In fact, I think you did that as well. You know, God, that's and just, so I, he I, did I, that for a lot of years. That is a yeah. When, so he had that all through the '60s, right? All through me growing up. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. I, um, yeah, he had it all all through the '60s, and then it, what would it have been? I think it was '69, and that was a bad year because. I want to say it was 69, and that gels with my age. It was. It was 1969 that the, the city took it away from him. But, uh, and yeah. And it was the Cubs collapsed. I mean, you're right. That that was a great year, and then it turned into a horrible yeah. year. Oh, and, you know, and you becoming a baseball fan. When did, was 69 the year that you really got into it, or were you already? No, I think I already was into it, but that was really probably the pinnacle of things. Um, yeah. You know, we used to go like I went as a child, of course, with my parents, my family. And then when I got old enough, you know, it was, sometimes I would go with my friends. We would take the Addison Street, Addison bus, went straight to Wrigley, and it wasn't that far from our house. You know, right. and that was probably more, you know, at the end, like 69 and then in the 70s when I was in high school. But um, right. a lot of my memories are going with your dad. Like there were that summers where your your mom didn't like to be alone you know and she would say you know come out you can bring your dog and she would let me bring banshee i don't know if you remember banshee, <laughs> Do I remember little, banshee? Were... are you kidding me of course yeah. i remember banshee. <laughs> that little fur ball yeah right it was a little yorkie and you guys had yeah. sam i think at that time and they got along yeah, okay yeah. so your mom was like just come and stay and you know i became friends with your babysitter kathy hickson right. became my very right. good friend we really did grow close and um so I remember a lot of times going with your dad, going back to the house in Glenview. But yes, yeah. I was a big Cub fan. I I really was a big Kessinger fan. Yeah. And uh, your dad used to tease us. My cousin Vicky liked Len Becker. And <laughs> your dad right. would say, well, but if I needed blood and Glenn needed blood, who would you give the blood to? <laughs> I don't know where he came up with it, but he would like to test us, you know, and we would say, you, you, you know, and, and with me, he would of say, course who you, would you give Ron. It to me? yeah, who would you give it to me or Kessinger? Well, of course you, you know, oh, and that's great. you know, it was funny because looking back, I never really, I mean, I realized who he was, but you know, he was this famous baseball player, but to me, he was family. He was just rotten, you know? So yeah. I always felt so comfortable in myself around him. I never felt, you know, like he was a celebrity type of thing. And he never acted that way. None of no, you guys no. did. You no, know? we didn't. Yeah, we were just, and, and, and just being around like you guys and the Polanos and, you know, I've had them on the show, Ricky and Billy. And now it's you and Linda. Um, I mean, just, we were all together for so yeah. many years. Yeah. And, um, all through my upbringing, I mean, from the time I was born until, you know, 12 years old. And it, it was just, wow, you know, it was, oh, and, it was amazing. And like talk about in like 69 and stuff. I remember spending a lot of time. It was mostly what I remember was Ricky and Bill and Ricky and Michael rather was yeah. Ricky and Michael were always around, you know, and I remember going yep. on, I don't know if it was 69, but we went to, in fact, I'm going to look into this because it was the Houston Astrodome. We went and to the I, yeah, I, we went to the Astrodome. Yeah, all of us. We yeah. went to the Astrodome, but was it when it just in my memory is like it was the first time the Cubs played there. I don't know if that's true. But no, I that's feel not like true. The Astrodome, it's not. I okay. think it was the first time they <laughs> took families and friends there. And and I see, we I see. went on the road trip. Man, remember they had that little band in the in the lobby that played or in, in oh <laughs> that, my gosh, yeah. Yeah. And then the toads that were on oh, it's Houston, the humidity. Oh yeah, remember that. I remember that the was... humidity definitely, and it smelled like cow crap. <laughs> we got yeah, right. Point. It totally did. Yeah, yeah. yeah and exactly. then we were we went to the Astrodome. Do you, I mean, not, I'm sorry, oh, yeah. Astro World. We went Astro World. I shipped, I shipped my tooth on the slanted mansion, or whatever the oh slant, my gosh. slanted house. Yeah, I I slipped and went right into the pole. 
Um, okay, I remember a lot of your guys' injuries. I didn't remember that one, but I yeah. do remember we stayed in a room. It was you and Ronnie, Michael, and Ricky, and I slept on a rollaway. And then your mom and dad were in the other room. And then I remember going to do. You, now there's another thing that I I don't know if I'm exaggerating this in my mind, but was Leo DeRocher was married to the woman who was the heir to Goldblatt, the department store, yeah, I, and her I, son I, I was think Joel so. I think Goldblatt. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Do you remember it? Do you remember him, Joel I, Goldblatt? I do not. I obviously I I do not remember. Okay. I obviously Leo all the time, but I not no no. Yeah, he was Leo's stepson, and he he was on that trip. That's how I remember okay. him. Okay. And he was on that trip, and we went to Astro uh, Astro World with him. And really? then I remember Glenn, Glenn. Yeah, Glenn even went with us for some reason. <laughs> Glenn came with us. I think we went a couple times. Right. But um, right. he was he was nice. He was a nice kid, actually. I thought okay. I was, he seemed okay. real nice and pretty normal. He didn't seem he didn't really seem affected or anything like that. He yeah. was kind of quiet. Yeah, I think he was kind of. Wow. I don't think he was raised the same way. Like maybe with so many kids around and like family, yeah, yeah. he seemed kind of like like he he liked it. He liked that we were like this big family with all these kids <laughs> right, and stuff. You right. know, he, he liked being but part I of that. I remember him being nice. Yeah, but I I yeah. just kind of forgot about him through the years and then thought about okay. him not too long ago. I had that. Wow. Yeah, your podcast has has triggered a lot of memories in me. Oh, so that's thank one you. of yeah. them. Now yeah, I gotta funny. ask you, like sixty sixty nine, what was that feeling like in sixty nine, before and after? Oh my gosh, it was on top of the world. It was so great to see the Cubs winning like that, to have, you know, such a tremendous team. They were just phenomenal, you know? Yeah. And again, you know, again, looking back, my gosh, what a how fortunate and blessed I was to be able to experience that the way that I did. You know, we used to go to the airport when they would come in. From yep. their out of town games, we would just go to yep. every game, you know, and just being on top of the world, fantastic. And you know, your dad being the captain and such a great leader and stuff. And and then yeah, the, you know when it the all the airport, fell apart, the airport, the airport. I remember being. I got a picture on your dad's shoulders at the airport in the crowd, us moving. Oh, you do. You know? Yeah, yeah. It doesn't surprise yeah, me. You yeah, spent a lot of time yeah. on Big Joe's shoulders. I did, didn't I? I did. It felt yeah, good sure up there. Did. It really felt good. Yeah. Because, you know, yeah. top of the world. So. Yeah. Yeah. But yes. Yeah, so, and then when it went south, you know, we, my parents were on that road trip to New York. I think I heard Ricky say the same thing. I didn't maybe remember yeah. that, uh, forgot that they were all there. But my, I remember my mom and dad went on that road trip and my mom coming back and saying that she was so proud of your dad, the way he had handled himself with the whole Don Young thing. It yeah. taught me a great lesson, a tremendous lesson, because she said I was so proud of him and that they had even gone out to eat with Don Young and that everything was fine, you know, and that your dad, she was just so proud of him. And then the next day, this article came out, right? Wasn't there a terrible uh, article written? Yeah, there was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And my mom's, you know, kind of using it as a, a teaching moment. And, and I do always remember that is how, you know, the press can take something and just twist it and everything you read is not factual, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, and even, you know, it went from being such a good thing to like such a sad, heavy feeling, you know? Yeah, it was, it was a, it was a tough thing in, in our life. I, I know my dad said it, it affected two years of his life as far as, you know, it stayed in his head because he had the death threats and everything. And I, I feel right. like, yeah, even some of the, you know, talking to the ball players about it on this podcast, some, it doesn't seem like they really had a full understanding of it either, you know? Um, I got that impression talk, too. I was yeah. surprised at like what Randy's yeah. view of it. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Randy didn't seem like he even was there to, to see the exchange. And then to, right. you know, the exchange, you know, my dad wouldn't say that to a player and, and um, obviously it, it it got back to him because, I mean, he left the clubhouse because of DeRocher, you know, everyone knows right. that, you know, it's just everything fell out of line. And I, and I remember at that time, because me and Ronnie, you know, that beer vendor that yelled at my dad as we were walking out of the, you know, through the concession area after the game and accosted right. my dad verbally. And then that became something. And, and that's when it kind of like became real to me like what's going on as a kid 
And then the death threats, I remember, right. you know, the FBI coming over and doing the forensic on a death threat. Oh, absolutely. And the absolutely. letter. And then and then I would start having nightmares. So, But do you remember that time with the FBI being around us all the time? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I do. I remember it really well. Um, I, I don't know if I remember correctly. I thought one of the guy's name was Jack, but I, I remember his face and his build very well. He was like a large guy. Mm-hmm. And he you know, we, we would be in the basement playing and he would come down, you know, he'd be down there and stuff. And he was very protective of you guys. I remember that. I remember, you know, again, my mom and dad feeling so protective over your parents, but especially your mom when your dad was going out of town, it was, it was heavy. It was a heavy duty thing, you know, to think that anybody that, you know, that this was could possibly even, you know, happen. And then knowing the way your dad was, you know, I'm still going to play. I'm still going to go. I'm still going to, you know, he never backed down from those type of situations. No, never. You know, never. and I, I really think he never backed down to, I don't think, to Leo either. I think they had a really good relationship. And I thought so, I think yeah. it was because Leo respected your dad. He might have been rough on your dad, but I think he expected a lot out of him because he was yeah. such a good leader and he did respect him. That was my take on it. You know, I never yeah. felt like there was a real... uh like there was an animosity or anything. I never felt that between them. But Leo, no, that, was, again, that's another very strong personality, very yeah, strong character, right. you know? Right. Yeah. And I remember as a kid being around Leo where I never felt a vibe like, oh, uh, you know, there was some uneasiness with my dad and him. I, I always no. felt, you know, the guy was legit. I mean, he, you know, as far as to the kids, you know, perspective, he was, you know, he'd tell us to leave when the game started, but he was pretty much like, hey, do what you guys got to do, you know, go play right. or whatever. And he was, you're right, I think they had they had a good relation until the end where it kind of got a little nuts where Leo was about ready to go. It got rough I, at I, the end. And that was, yeah. that, I think that was just a difference. And, I, I mean, my honest opinion is I think he didn't want to see your dad become like, I hate to say like how a lot the players are now, but where it becomes more commercialized, where they're charging yeah. for autographs or they're, you know, and yeah. I think that was where he wanted it to just be about the game, get out there, play the game, like. You know, that whole – wasn't there a blow-up over the Ron Sano Day thing? Or not a well, blow-up, but he wasn't yeah. really in favor. I shouldn't say blow-up. Randy but. brought that up, and it was – well, because uh, somehow Leo said that, that my dad, uh, you know, worked out a deal to have it because uh, Ernie, Ernie and Billy had one. But that was for the diabetes, and that's what they, they were talking about, how to give money to diabetes. So that whole thing, sure. again, I, I didn't even get into it, but – you know, my dad got really upset about that when Leo brought it up, like, oh, you just want a day? And he's like, that was it. That was like, no, no, no because no. that was never I'm what a- it was about. I It was the same thing when uh, your dad, that's how the whole basketball, the Cubs playing basketball started, was because of your dad doing a benefit. My Uncle Sid had passed away. He was barely, I think he was yeah. 30 years old and he had four children, you know, yeah. and passed away so suddenly. And your dad you know, put on this basketball game where there was the Cub players against the three high schools. It was Elmwood Park and the two Leidens and yeah. the coaches, and it sold out. I mean, the gym at our high school was sold out, of course, and yeah. it didn't start for your dad to be, you know, to be there being on the center of attention. It was all about my uncle, and it was yeah. all because of your dad. I mean, I really almost get, want to cry because it was because of your dad that my cousins got to go to college, you know? Wow. And so he, I always wow. felt he, all his motives were always for good. You know, it was always yeah. about diabetes. It was always about something like that. It was never about himself. Even when he, he wasn't, wasn't like at that. his best, it was about something good. Like he would be arch, you know, it's like, yeah, I always look at my dad as like, he would get in some beefs, but it was always about sticking up. And then maybe he might, you know, just go a little bit too, too much on it because that's how he was. I mean, he kind of fought everything. You know, growing well, up, I mean, that was just you, know, you have an Italian. Behavior. Like I've learned, I've learned about the whole Italian temper, and you know, the Scandinavians too. They're they were Vikings. You know, they do have <laughs> right. like a temper. You know, right, and so right. sometimes you just can't help it, and you have to learn to right. kind of rein it in. You know, yeah. So I always thought you were more yeah. that way than Ronnie. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I no, no, you were more that way than Ronnie. You know. Oh wow. Yeah, tell me about what you thought about me and Ronnie as kids. What were we, the difference of us, and what were we like to you as, you know, obviously you saw us grow up. Yeah, you know, it's funny because, I I mean, of course, I love you both the same. I could never, like, choose one's my favorite or anything, but you were different, you know. Like, Ronnie was more, Ronnie was more like he, 
would act like he wasn't your dad's son. Like people would come up after the game. And this wasn't just once. This was a repetitive thing. I remember it. Like they would come up and say, I know you're on Santo's son. And he would say, no, like he wasn't. And no, I, you know, I'm their brother. And we have a dog named Shane. He would make up a story. Now this is when he was pretty young. No. And Shane was, yeah, my cousin Vicky's dog was Shane, you know, but he's like, yeah, we, you know, they're, they're, he didn't, I guess maybe it was like too personal. I don't think he was because he was embarrassed or wanted to deny, but he didn't right. like the people like knew all this, knew about him before they really knew him, you know? Yeah. Wow. And don't get mad at me or anything, but you were more like, you know, you, I remember sitting behind the screen at home plate and you had a glove and, and this guy says, you know, hey, young man, you know, you're not going to catch a ball back here. And you said, well, I don't have to. I'm on Santa's son. <laughs> <laughs> but not like in a bratty way. It wasn't a bratty oh, way. Just you know? a matter of fact way. I was telling the facts. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. And like another oh. time, we were the only people in Wrigley Field, literally. It was Kathy Hicks, and we used to have a picture of Kathy and I sitting, and it was just empty, and it was just us. And, and it was you and Ronnie, of course. And you, I mm-hmm. feel like your dad was always the first one at the ballpark. I don't know if that's true or not, but it right, seemed like right, it. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah, he was, uh, the, yeah, he was always there early. Yeah. Right? I feel like he oh, was the yeah. first one. And then the Andy Frank came up to us and said, you know, you have to leave. I don't know how you got in here. but And you just said, you were uh, like, mister, just wait right here. You know, just wait right here. And I think he thought you were going to get like an adult. And then the next thing you were on the field and you're like, hey, mister. But you're like waving your arms like a little kid, you know, wait, waving your arms. Hey, mister, look at me, you know. And he's oh, like, my what? God. And he starts running like, you know, he's going to chase you around, chase you around Wrigley Field. I don't remember how it ended, to be honest with you. <laughs> so you guys were different. You were different. Oh, and, I'd say. Oh, my God. Yeah. Now, but, yeah, now, you know, you guys always got along. I think you were typical brothers. I don't feel like you yeah, fought we more did. than no, We always got along. Brothers. Now I know why Ronnie thought I was a pain in the ass. Um, so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I do remember like yeah I was I was uh I felt protected because I had two layers I had I had my dad sure, and I had the cup sure. team and then I had Ronnie so right. uh, but yeah Ronnie was more secretive about that stuff yeah that's interesting yeah yeah he kept them more close to to us and and that and again not that I don't think you guys were always like you, I love the way you were raised it was a great role model for me I'll tell you what I really did use it a lot in my own parenting with RJ because your mom was never like, you know, if you wanted a pet, she wasn't going to just run out and buy you a dog. You know, it's like, okay, you get a goldfish first. Let's see how you do with that. You have to have the response. You know, like, and then she would build up to it. And then when she's not around, your sister Linda goes and gets me piranhas. But go on, tell the story. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she did. Wait, didn't you guys dump them into the lake too? Like, No, <laughs> no, oh, no. Okay. I would have never <laughs> swam in that lake. You couldn't after, after it bit my finger, I think it was okay, the execution I was think on. That was something, I think you guys played a trick on me. That's what it was. That's yeah, no, said. never. They dumped no, them into the no, lake. No, yeah, no, okay. No, no. That yeah, hurt yeah, ourselves. No. Yeah. Uh, right, exactly. Yeah, now as an adult thinking back, that didn't make any sense. But at the <laughs> time, I think I was terrified right. to go in the lake. Right. Like, I don't know if it's that was worse or the telephone man who supposedly oh. broke through the ice and God, was laying right. at the bottom of the lake. But, um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, Linda, Linda, you said she bought Ronnie a Playboy when we went to Hawaii. You remember our trip to oh Hawaii? You might have been too young. Yeah, I was young, but I remember it a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was well, an eight-hour flight. And Linda, they were like, a good older Ronnie sister be- buying. That's a good older sister buying <laughs> yeah. the young young boy a Playboy. Oh my god! Well, they were concerned about the eight hour flight, and Linda's like, I know how to keep Ronnie busy. Comes back with a Playboy, and I'm like, really? You know, I was just mortified, mortified. <laughs> oh. And he, we didn't hear a peep out of him that whole time. Oh, of course not. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> Oh God, that's classic. That's, that's classic. so funny. Oh. Yeah. Now you yeah, know, talk about with, with 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 spring training. Um, you came down to spring training with us more than once, but uh, you were down there when my when my dad's when my grandparents were yeah. killed in a car accident. Talk talk about that. Yeah. Yeah, I was. Um, I it was my first trip. I got to go with friends, you know, on a plane. Like you know, it was, I was in high school. And I went with two of my friends, and we went and we stayed at the Ramada. You guys were yeah, um, 
the townhomes that eventually you, you guys always stayed at. But before, right, prior right. to that, I remember the Ramada, so it just like made oh, sense yeah. for us to stay at the Ramada. That's where a lot of the players were. Right. And that's probably why I wanted to stay there, to be honest. Yeah. And then no, uh, that was, yeah, that, that was a great place to stay. I Man, they had that little diner yeah. in the, that everyone would eat at. Yeah, that was yeah, it was great. Yeah, it was yeah. just I loved that hotel. I mean, it was just a little oh. hotel, but I loved that place. Oh, it's and beautiful. then um, yeah. so the night your your mom and dad asked if we could babysit, you know, and of course that's we were there to see your parents and see the cubs you know and yeah. so we went and babysat you guys and your dad uh, your dad brought us home was like you know what do you, tomorrow i don't know if he's going to pick us up or just leave us tickets to be honest i'm not really sure how we got to the ballpark but yeah. like prior time you know but um he the next morning my mom called and said that your grandma and grandpa had been you know involved in this crash and you know my mom of course was going to go to Seattle for the services. And she said, you know, if you want to stay, stay. And if, but if you want to come home, come home. But, you know, Ryan and Judy, of course, you have to leave. And, uh, and then your dad, I mean, this always, to this day, it still amazes me that he had the wherewithal or whatever to, he, um, he asked Carmen Fanzone was on the team at the time. Right. And he told him, could, you know, these girls are there, they're by themselves. Can you keep an eye on them? And I'll tell you what he did. He he woke us up in the morning playing the trumpet. It was the cutest thing. Uh, he woke us That's up awesome. and made sure we had breakfast. I think he brought us donuts the one morning. He had we still went to a wow. game. He left us tickets to a game. We ended up, you know, we really didn't like go to all the games. We stayed by the pool a lot and stuff. I was upset, you know. I well, I absolutely adored both of your yeah. grandparents. Were exceptional people. Yeah. They were really exceptional yeah. people. Yeah. And yeah. uh, Vivian was just the sweetest woman on this earth. Vivian Johnny. was amazing. Yeah. And Vivian was, was amazing. So, yeah, she was just an amazing lady that we, yeah, lost very early in, in, in our our lives. Um, and, yeah, um, and John, the, the stepdad, my dad, he was he was great, too. I mean, I, I can oh, just picture them both. Oh, he couldn't be nicer. Yeah. Couldn't be nicer uh-huh. and just fit right mm-hmm. in. I remember they would come to the yeah. house. I, my mom always had the parties, you know, we're always at our house. We, it right. wasn't huge. We had the little above ground pool, and we had, you know, we had enough. You know, we had our basement. You had that so cool nice little night. basement had, with the with the bar, oh, and the, I remember awesome. dancing down there a lot. You know, so yeah. yeah, yeah. My dad took like a cement basement and turned it into such a beautiful uh, yeah. entertainment area. You know, but oh, I, I mean, oh, now so many yeah. memories of that. You know, but um, yeah. So unfortunately, there was just a horrible, horrible thing that happened. And, and, yeah. uh, but I, it always amazed me that your dad, you know, told Carmen to keep an eye on us and that, that he his mind was even there, you know, to do that. Yeah, it's, it's and amazing. and it I amazing. know it devastated yeah. him and for him to come yeah. back, you know, and go right back into baseball. And I remember Glenn went, of course, right. Glenn went yeah. with your Glenn dad went, and yeah. uh-huh. went so much to him. Yeah. Yeah. It did. It did. Yeah. 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 That was, uh, I tell you, yeah, it's such uh, memories, and uh, you guys were, I mean, family, you know, Sherry, and uh, yeah. yeah, miss you, and it's just so good talking to you. One last thing I do want to say, you know, going to this old Cub, Big Joe Productions, so people could know now, the reason Big Joe Productions in the beginning there is because of your dad, yeah. Joe Manorese, you know, I oh, love that man, you. I love your yes. mom, yeah. all you guys um, were just, uh, well, they loved my you. older sisters, That's- and yeah. Yeah. And I don't want to exclude my sister Linda in this, but but yeah, she you know she came in '69, so I was just comparing me and Ronnie because because of the baseball oh, of stuff. Course. But, of course, yeah. Oh well, Linda yeah. came out. The whole world was tipped down at the excess, yeah, because the, you know yeah. the girl, little girl came, and we all just we were old enough to really appreciate and adore her, you know. Yeah, she but, took um, over. There's I, no doubt. Yeah, she took over yeah, my dad's absolutely. world, and no doubt, no doubt. And she she had a lot like me. She had that. She had a lot like she. She'd like to do. She would have probably done the same stuff I was doing, uh, as far as being outgoing with my dad. You know what I mean? Where Ronnie yes, was more yes. secretive. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've always been so glad that you know. There's so many reasons I'm glad he went into broadcasting. He was fantastic at it. You know, it brought yeah. him back into. In it's my it. view, he was the biggest celebrity in Chicago at the time when he, you know, got unfortunately passed. But you know, he really was. He was. Everyone loved him, and in that that role and stuff, but I'm glad yeah. she got to see that because she didn't really get to 
do yeah. you know experience all the things that we did i mean i right. i got to go to colorado with you guys to show yeah. me us on that trip i mean that I, yeah. it's just endless time you know wonderful wonderful yeah. times and memories i yeah. have to say one thing my cousin vicky wanted to be sure i told you that she did not like ricky she liked billy because my oh. sister linda said that <laughs> yeah so she said would wow. you please put it in a disclaimer that it was billy that i liked it was me that liked ricky ah. yeah, that's with you. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i will tell and billy's recently divorced so maybe you know <laughs> i heard i feel bad i i didn't know until i heard no, him and so i thought billy, i heard him say something billy billy's billy always survives man billy's about as tough as they come so absolutely uh, yeah. great guy yeah. he's a great yeah, guy he'll do fine yep and one last thing I want to ask you about is, is my mom. And I know you always talk how important she was in your life. Um, oh, my you know, gosh, I, she's so important. I look at my mom, right, and I, I go back and I go, she just let us do so many things. I'm like, but, you know, she was always there. Like, she was like a big right. chaperone, but didn't, didn't like, micromanage us. What, what were your thoughts? Well, you know, I always thought it was like because she was younger than there. I think there's like exactly 20 years between my mom and your mom. And so I always looked at it like your mom was, you know, she was like the cooler. She's like my mom's cool younger sister. You know, they had a big (laughs) age gap or something because she did let us do. She she was, you know, she was cooler. She was more understanding because she lived during a different time than my mom, you know. Right. And she was she did let you guys do a lot. But yet. She, you know, she always made sure you were safe. Like a, a lot of the things that we did, again, now you could never do like being on the back of the snowmobile, you know, on a saucer sled right. being pulled by a snowmobile with no helmet on. And I remember you being on the mini bike, Ronnie driving and you sitting backwards with your can- your video camera, you know, taking yeah, movies yeah, and yeah, stuff, yeah, you know, with nothing. Stand-ups. I mean, my God, if he's, yeah, if he stops fast, geez, you know, you, you're on the back facing backwards, no helmet, your hands are not holding on, you know, but um, I, a lot of it, I don't think she knew about, you know, yeah. But, um, yeah. yeah, she was, she was, I mean, she, I can't say enough good about your mom. She was the most tremendous person. She let your dad be your dad. She yeah. loved baseball. I mean, she, you know, she, she, I think she had a great admiration for his talent and yeah. that, but she also wasn't the type, she wasn't going to be there every day because it just wasn't her. You know, she was, you know, but um, I I think she was just, she still is, she's just a phenomenal person. I look up to her greatly. And she, she was, she let us be us, but without being, you know, being negligent. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. You know, there you go. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. I don't know why I'm just thinking about when we used to play flashlight tag, I have to say this real quick. Um, do you remember like how big flashlight tag was to us? Yeah. We yeah. would pay, play on the lake and you know, it was dark and we'd have the flashlights and we'd be alone. You know, you'd be by yourself running right. around with this flashlight and stuff. We just had so much fun. It was so much fun. So many great memories. The sailboat. Yeah. I got yeah. shot in the back by Glenn Burns because he, <laughs> he was shooting at the, he said he was shooting at the float I was laying at, but he shot me in the back with the BB gun. Anyway, a lot of fun sh- time. Are you? <laughs> no, you don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember getting shot in the back. I mean, I remember you know Terry O'Brien getting shot with a pellet gun, and I shot him with a BB gun. I didn't know you got shot by a neighbor with a BB yeah. gun. Yeah. That... <laughs> yeah. Everybody thought I was being dramatic. I'm like, something hit me. Something ever like every year you're so dramatic wow. type of thing. And then sure enough, wow. they're like, you got a mark on your back. You got a BB. And then he, we figured out it was Glenn, and he would, Glenn Burns, not that Kurt, and he said he was, oh. I was laying on a float, which I was, and he said he tried to shoot the float. He thought it would be funny. Oh, that's funny. But, yeah. Wow. What would your dad say about lot, that? Wow. Good times. Yeah, he wasn't happy. Wow. I think he had a word wow. with Mr. Burns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, Sherry. So great to talk to you. Thank you for Staying being here. my cracker, Jack. I love you so much, okay? Thank so, you, Jeff. I love you, too. Thank you so much for having okay. me. It's an honor. Absolutely. I'm really proud of you. Very proud uh, of you. Thanks, Sherry. All right. Okay. I'll love talk you. To you soon. Take okay. care. Love you, too. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to our show. Special thanks to our cool Cracker Jacks. 
Scott Nelson, Jim McCauley, Debbie Foley, Sherry Matarisi, Terry Rankin Gurovitz, Terry O'Brien, Gary Tallman, and Anne Marie Pascule. This show is made possible because of all of them, because of all of our subscribers, and to you for listening. If you want to support the show and be a cool Cracker Jack yourself, subscribe on our Patreon page by cl- clicking the link below this episode or go to our website, www.peanutspopcornandcrackerjacks.com. And remember to click the follow button for next week's episode and leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. We love those reviews. We love those reviews. And don't hesitate to write, give us suggestions, tell us how you're liking the show. Email jeff.ppcpodcast at gmail.com. For my closing quote, you just can't beat the person who never gives up. Babe Ruth. Toodaloo. Cracker Jacks. Santofilms.com. The place to buy this old cub DVDs, posters, and this old cub t-shirts. Get yourself one now at Santofilms.com.